you have an interesting story. Um, you donated a kidney. Now, for me, I did not know like like you know much about it except for a few family members that you know that were sick and needed one and like I but I never heard much about it and you came over one Chavez and we were schmoozing and I was like okay this is this is really fascinating first of all there's a whole a whole so there's so many people that are donating um kidneys and I know that over here there's a, a town which um in the world it's known as like a very extremist town the city of Yitzhar and it has the highest rate of of you know per capita of people that are donating kidneys um and there's and there's a big movement like you know why not if you're given two so so tell us a little bit about i want to hear about your personal story i want to hear about just the idea about it because it was so fascinating fascinating to me then and i'm sure so many people out there would love to hear about it well uh, yeah first of all thank you for asking I'm, I'm always happy to talk about it to me I, I i was inspired by other people and if i can bring this to more more people and in, encourage more people to have the conversation that would definitely make me happy but i actually want to share a short anecdote so you said here in israel um yitzhar has the highest per capita rate of kidney donation in in the u.s or i don't know in the entire u.s but definitely in the jewish community interestingly the highest rate is in new square in square so um yeah so just just to, to before i get into my story i'll share a story that i have so uh, the person who I flew into the U.S. to donate the kidney, finished the process, two weeks later flew home. The individual who drove to the airport and helped, helped us uh, schlep our luggage uh, was, was an ex skver chassid, very much ex skver, And he was also a kidney donor. So I said to him, I said, listen, I know skver is a very high rate, but like you're not really part of the community. How do you explain it? He said, it's very simple. Since I'm little, a lot of my neighbors, my family donated kidneys. He said, I was jealous. <laughs> he said, I was jealous. So when I was able to, I went ahead and did it. And th I mean, his story is mind blowing. But besides that, he, he donated, uh, I mean, his wife is apparently incredible as well. He, he donated when his wife was nine months pregnant with uh, a complicated pregnancy. So yeah, yeah his, his story is a, a lot more exciting than mine. But I'll maybe just share a little bit of the philosophy that goes into it and what led me uh, through this and touch a little bit on the process as well. So um, I was in Yeshiva, in uh, Yeshiva Torah Traga for a gap year program about uh, eight years ago now. My Rebbe, uh, his name is Rabbi Dr. Eiffel, he lives in uh, Beit Shemesh as well. He's a pediatric cardiologist. And one of the many things he tried doing was try to bring, as possible, bring both his expertise and in general, uh, bring Torah to become relevant to us in as many ways as possible. So uh, a very interesting debate is about um, death and halacha. At what point is someone considered dead? And where it becomes most relevant is in the, the aspect of organ donation. So uh, who invited who, but a debate was arranged between a man named Rabbi Berman who runs a, an organization called the Hebrew Organ Donors, Halachic Organ Donor Society, which promotes uh, people donating, signing cards to donate their organs after death. And my Rebbe, on, specifically on the concept of when in halacha is someone considered dead. Um, there are different positions. I mean, in very short, my Rebbe represented the traditional mainstream opinion that only if some, a person is only considered dead after their, their heart cessates, you know, their heart is no longer beating. And Rabbi's position was that after brain death, a person is considered dead. And they both had, you know, it was a very interesting. Uh, what was most interesting to me was just hearing the stats about how many people die waiting for organs, whether it's hearts or lungs or kidneys. And one of those organs is something that we are all given, as I view it, a spare one. Um, so my Rebbe actually, after that debate, he went back and he gave us a shear on, on, on organ donation. It wasn't just organ donation in terms of giving blood, because there is a certain risk involved. And if someone should give blood, if there's a mitzvah, obviously he, he ruled that it's a, a, a mitzvah to give blood based on the minimal risk factor and the maximum benefit factor and a few other concepts without oversimplifying a very... What's the risk of giving blood? Well, there's a risk of doing anything. You're putting a needle into your body, right? So um, if, if, it's not, if there's not properly sanitized, there, there's a risk. But the risk is, is, is uh, I, don't, I don't want to inflate the risk. The risk is you know, 0. 0.00001. It's not, it's not, no, you're not likely to have an issue, but... Um, and then he went further into other things that people can donate, right? Kidneys, uh, bone marrow, liver lobe, a few different things. So basically, he, um, his opinion, I don't want to, once again, quote him incorrectly, his opinion was more or less that people who are healthy and able to give blood are obligated to do so. 
and other things you're not obligated, but you're allowed to do so. Uh, from there, I, I went and researched it a little bit and I said, you know what, like so many people, there are many people who do this, but many people don't. I don't have any good reason not to. I'm healthy. I'm not fearful of surgery. Um, and I, I decided back then that I was something I'm going to do. I was dealing with a different uh, battle, quote unquote, with uh, my, my mother in terms of drafting to the IDF. And I felt it, was, it wasn't good to bring in too many different battles. <laughs> um, and on top of that, I, I felt, um, you know, it could complicate things as well. So I decided that, um, you know, this is in the back of my mind. Once I complete my IDF service, is this something I want to go into? I looked into it. Uh, more from a medical perspective, although from a logic perspective, I was covered as well. And I felt very secure that this is something that there isn't an issue doing, meaning they, they put you through such an intensive process to determine if they'll even take your, your kidney. And I said, if they're willing to take it, then I'm willing to give it. So uh, long story short, we finished my army service, uh, met my wife during my army service, got married, and uh, I sprung it on her pretty fast. I said, Hannah, I want to donate a kidney. And she's like, okay, is it safe? You know, we discussed it a little bit and she's like, okay, I see you're into this and you know, I'm behind you. <laughs> so she was very supportive, which helps. Um, interestingly, one of the kidney donors I spoke to, he asked his Rav and his, uh, his Rav said that one of the, one of the two conditions he gave him was that your wife has to allow it. So, um, I, I mean, I, I didn't check, but, uh, she did allow it. <laughs> and, I started going through the process here in Israel. I, I, there's a lot of tests that you have to do, which one of the positive side effects of it is they say that you're doing so many tests that if you do have something wrong, you'll discover tests that you wouldn't routinely do. So I went through it, right? Uh, different blood tests and different uh, x-rays and scans. And this is all being done through their organizations that, I'm that sorry, organize I should, I should all mention, this? I should mention, thank you for asking. Yes. Uh, here in Israel, I went through an organization called Mat Mat Chaim, an incredible organization. The head of the organization, Rabbi Haber, is actually currently um, not doing so well from coronavirus, so uh, he should have a quick oh, Yeah. So um, I went through the process with their help. Uh, there definitely was a, a bureaucratic aspect of it, although I can say every aspect the doctors were beyond supportive um, from my general practitioner who right away, she said, oh, that's great, you know, gave me, asked me a few questions to make sure she thinks I'm ready, sent me to all the different appointments, and I went through step by step and everything was really going smoothly. And they did a kidney ultrasound and they revealed, I don't want to say it's an issue. They revealed a minor potential issue. Um, and I thought it wouldn't be an issue because it really, it's not a medical issue and it's not something we anticipated would become an issue. And she said, uh, the person organizing, facilitating it, uh, she said, I'm letting you know now they're not going to accept your kidney. <laughs> And I fought for it and I brought some scientific articles proving that it's not an issue. And she said, no, they have such a concern here uh, for the health of the donor that if they have even a slight sus uh, suspicion that it can cause an issue down the road, they won't take it. And that's what are they afraid of? Um, they're, they're afraid they don't want the donor to have any issue that can result or arise due to the, the procedure. So even though that wasn't really the case here, and all signs indicated that it wouldn't be an issue. They said, we're, we're not taking any chances. I mean, but there's no issue. There's no issue with the kidney itself. Oh, and, and, but shouldn't, and shouldn't that be your decision anyway? Well, that's a good question. Um, right. In a libertarian society, we may say that's my, uh, that's my uh, it's choice. It's your kidney. It's your choice. But in it's Israel, there's a special medical review board that reviews in depth every single case. At, they take all your, your, you know, from your general practitioner to your blood work, urine work x-rays, scans, you meet with a social worker, you fill out questionnaires, they take everything, and only if they think you're a perfect candidate will they take it from you. So many, many people, including many healthy people that I've encountered, actually end up getting rejected. Hmm. In Israel specifically, where they're very, very cautious. And for that reason, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's uh, under 200 people a year who are giving in Israel currently. Wow. So on one hand- You, um, you know what the numbers are of people that need kidneys in Israel? I don't know offhand, but there's over a thousand waiting that I do know. Wow. Yeah. So um, for me, that was a very, uh, hearing that was very, it was defeating in a sense. Uh, but on the other hand, I did take pride in the fact that they, they value so much the life of individuals that they won't put us at any slight risk. So uh, I kind of shelved it. You know, I went through the process and it didn't work out and I put it on the side uh, for the time being. A friend of mine um, 
she she posted on Facebook. She she donated to her father a kidney in the U.S. and she told her story, and it kind of reignited my my desire to do so. So I spoke to her, and she said, "Oh, speak to renewal, speak to renewal in the U.S. Just have the conversation." So I, I called up. What's uh, renewal? Renewal is this, the equivalent of Matnat Chaim in Israel that actually predates Matnat Chaim. It's an organization in the U.S. that facilitates kidney donations in, within the Jewish community. And they're incredible. I mean, I'll talk about a little bit just some of the things that I experienced from them, but the level of care, they take care of every aspect from the medical to the financial to the emotional. They, they have everyone covered. It's, it's really wow. unbelievable. And, and seeing the most inspiring part of the whole process was seeing how many good people we have in our community and how much they do. It's, it's wow. mind-boggling. So um, I, I, I spoke to the head of uh, Renewal, uh, well, not the head of Rabbi Steinmetz, and he talked me through the process, and he asked me some questions, and he said, there's a legitimate chance you'll be accepted for kidney donation in the United States if that is something you would like to do. So I, I thought about it, and I said yes, and I, he said, okay. Um, you know, I said, I'm coming to the U.S. anyways. He arranged for all my testing, months of testing, to be done in two days. In wow. two days, they have good relations with all the hospitals there. The hospitals love them. They're, 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 they see the amount of life-saving work they do. They see how they treat them, everyone respectfully. And in two days, I knocked off all different tests. A few weeks later, they came back and they said, uh, everything looks good. There are one or two things we want you to do, follow-up tests, to be you know, extremely cautious. Um, and maybe just a side point. The reason in the U.S. they're more liberal, maybe it's also a philosophy thing in terms of kidney donation, but it's also they have – because they have kidney transplant centers there that do in, in two months or in one month what the entire Israel does in an entire year. So they really have specialists, people who do hundreds of surgeries a year in kidney donations, and they're more confident in their abilities. Um, they put me through the additional testing, and they said, we are comfortable with you donating. If you want to donate, we're ready for it. So uh, Renewal matched me up to someone. They, they found someone else in their system. Uh, a woman can, I, from, can I ask you a question? Were you worried, meaning the fact that Israel didn't take you, but now they would? Like, w was there a fear of that, hey, if you know you, you, you give a kidney, maybe something could happen down the road? So that's a good question. It's a great question. Um, I, I dealt with a lot of different concerns, and there are a lot of legitimate questions going into with kidney donation. I mean, just to touch on them, what happens if someone in your family needs? What happens if the donor doesn't make it? Three per, I'm sorry, the recipient doesn't make it. Three percent of recipients don't accept uh, the new organ. Uh, there's all these different things that you have to deal with on a psychological level, on a, you know, what happens if you're out of work for a few months. So these are all things that I dealt with, and I spoke to uh, a lot of professionals, medical professionals. I spoke to a lot of kidney donors, and I was far more than satisfied in the responses I received. So um, with, like I said, in the U.S., because they, there are places that specialize in kidney transplants, this is what they do day in and day out. Uh, it was very comforting. And also, I never intended on dropping out, but they tell you until the, the moment, until you sign the waiver, the day of surgery, you can drop out with zero repercussions. So I knew that I'm going through this, and if I'm not comfortable at any point, I have that option. You meet your surgeon, you meet the doctors, you meet the hospital staff, you meet social workers, you meet so many people, you're like, if they all think I'm okay, I'm okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, uh, I went through the process, everything was cleared. We, I said, okay, when can I give it? They said, we'll take it whenever you'll give it. <laughs> you tell us, there's such a, a big need. There's you know, over 100,000 people waiting they said, you, if you, you tell us, we'll find you a match, we'll deal with everything. So um, they found a woman from Texas who was a perfect match to me. Uh, there, there's always matches. Some people assume it's like, uh, you know, like bone, um, bone marrow, you know, where they do the swabs and it has to be a perfect match with kidneys. There are so many people waiting that you always have matches. It's never a, a concern. Um, long story short, fast forward two months, came in about 10 days before my surgery. We had some other curveballs thrown at us. I got strep. And a minor flu right before my surgery, which is going to prevent me getting cleared. I got clearance for my surgery. Finally, I went in for three rounds of testing till all my numbers were perfect. Three days before surgery, um, the donor, think, uh, the recipient, excuse me, thank God was healthy as well, which is also crucial all the time. If she gets a cold, she, you can't give it. Went through with my surgery. Um, came out. My, my initial days of recovery, I would say, were much less intensive than expected. You know, you have pain, you can't move, you're weak, but I expected it to be worse. Two weeks later, I was cleared to fly by the doctor. I flew home to Israel. Uh, Renewal uh, and their donors helped cover the ticket, or helped, not helped cover, covered the ticket, and the ticket for my wife as well. 
And we came back to Israel two and a half weeks later, I would say I was already at 99%. So it was, you know, I, I, I have the luxury of having a job that enables me to work from home, which I think many of us have now. Uh, I have the luxury of having a very supportive wife and a wife that's willing to take on all the child care for the first six weeks. Um, have obviously the renewal working with renewal was, was incredible. And uh, to me, it was, it was a no brainer. I mean, I, my, my company also said, take off whenever you need to do what you want. I have to be thankful for them as well. And all the pieces just fell in place. And here I am, uh, we're now four months later and it's like, it never happened. You know, I have a few scars on my stomach you know, we battle scars. It's all good. <laughs> and uh, thank God we, I, I heard from two weeks ago, the recipient messaged me that she's a hundred percent recovered as well. Just to check on me. And wow. it, I mean, it, it's awesome. Yeah. There's, there's a lot more little anecdotes. If there's anything specific you want, want to discuss more, I'm more than happy to. Yeah. I was going to ask you about if you got a chance to meet the recipient and if you made a connection. That's, that's uh, yeah. Um, going in, you have the option of choosing who you want to donate to. Um, thankfully none of my close family or friends or family and friends were in need at the time. So I didn't have to make that decision. And ultimately what I told renewal was, I don't want to play God. You know, I don't need to determine who this has the opportunity to save. So I let them do that job. I think that's probably the toughest job is determining who gets and who doesn't. Um, and they, they chose this woman for whatever, you know, obviously cause it was a perfect match and whatever other criteria they take into account. They, I didn't know anything about her. I didn't know who was going to, uh, the day of, I, I found that it was a woman. That was, that was the extent of what I found out. And then afterwards, uh, based on those very strict laws, only if both the donor and the recipient are open to revealing that, can you reveal that? And I, I will mention also, if you have someone you do want to donate to and you're not a match, they do what's called donor chains, which is incredible also, where basically uh, one person will donate to one person's uncle and then, you know, their brother-in-law will donate to that person's, you know, sister in place. And they wow. do these donor chains of 20, 30 people to make sure that everyone's family member gets taken care of. So it's really cool. Um, it is really cool. And yeah, so we, we, I, I want so to small. Go- just going forward, if anyone in our extended family needs a kidney, we have an in now. Because you gave one already. It's a good question. It's a good question. So here in Israel, actually, uh, the law di- <coughs> the law dictates, or Manal Chaim really dictates, that anyone who donates, them and their seven closest family members, right, parents, siblings, kids, a spouse, are jumped to the top of the list for any organ donation that they need. So in a sense, you're benefiting the family because, uh, you know, if God forbid if someone needs in 30 years, I may no longer be a candidate, but they still would be at the top of the list. Um, because I didn't donate here, I actually sent them an email and I said, would you be willing to extend that to me despite the fact that I donated in America? And they said, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, we understand you tried here. In the U.S., uh, the law says that only you yourself, meaning the donor themselves, if they need for any reason. However, I, I pray that it never comes to that. But if it does, I think you have a pretty good uh, marketing. You know, I donated a kidney and now X person from my close circle needs uh, I think, I think that'd do pretty well in ga- gaining attention. And that's really what, what brings donors in is attention. Stories bring donors in. Um, and yeah. I have many, many stories to share, but yeah. So we, yeah, we, uh, getting back to what you asked, uh, they asked me if I'm comfortable meeting the recipient. I said, I would love to, as long as she's comfortable with it. Um, and she said, yeah, she would be open to it. Uh, she had a more complex surgery than I did for various reasons, which I, you know, I can't really share. But I went in to meet her three days later, right, right as I was leaving the hospital. And uh, it, it was a powerful experience, an incredible experience. I still was, you know, a little bit on uh, narcotics and wasn't fully present. <laughs> but um, we, we met and, and, and the, she had immense gratitude and I had immense gratitude as well uh, to the organization for facilitating it, to, to God for keeping us both healthy and that she survived, <laughs> you know, and all that. And uh, they told her she has a 10-week recovery ahead of her. And she said, don't worry what they say. I'll be out of here in a few weeks. And lo and behold, she's a strong woman and she got out of that and she's healthy and recovering. And I mean, uh, yeah, it was a really, a really powerful moment. We, we took pictures together. And yeah, from there, uh, we haven't, we've been in touch only a little bit. Obviously, she has her, herself to focus on. And then sometimes recipients have a discomfort. Which she didn't. Is, there's a little bit of, you know, the person who, who, in a sense, facilitated the saving of your life. It, it becomes like a, an uncomfortable situation. So sometimes they actually prefer not to meet their donor, even though they have immense uh, appreciation on Karsatovta, and they, they, they don't want to do so. 
but uh, I was happy I did. For me, it was powerful, uh, you know, to see a human being and, you know, maybe like in like, I don't know, 1984, one of, one of those uh, books where people just, <laughs> maybe she didn't make it and they're just telling me she did to make me feel good. So it was good to see her. It was good to see, <laughs> it was good to see her. It was good to, you know, to see that she's doing well. Her, her husband was also a real, a real sweet person. And I got to meet the people that are, you know, able to have a family member longer living with them. And it was very powerful, inspiring. Right. It's also good to meet the person that way, you know, the kidney actually went somewhere and they didn't sell it on some black market for $80,000 or something. We consider that, we, we, we consider that option too. <laughs> there, there is a market, there is a market for organs, right? There, there's a big market for it. Um, I, I happen to have uh, personal knowledge of it, but I think for the sake of the people involved, it'd be better if we don't share that information here. <laughs> Uh, my, my surgeon, my surgeon, his name was Dr. Galb, uh, he's an excellent surgeon, uh, Jewish as well. And I, I told him, I said, uh, when I met with him, so the first thing I told him, I said, Dr. Galb, you're Jewish, right? He says, yes. I said, you're, you have a Jewish mother. Yes. I said, if anything goes wrong, just remember, I have a mother, a wife, and five sisters. You will never live this down. <laughs> so that's what I said to, to Dr. Galb. And he says, uh, yeah, he says, I, I totally understand. I, I, I'm scared of my mother. I'm definitely not going to, you know, we'll do our utmost to keep you healthy. But um, one of the things he specializes in is actually the black market. Um, and he, what he explained to me that the black market has many deficiencies and, and the success rate with organ donations in the black market is much lower for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is, is that uh, the donors have an incentive to cut corners and to lie on the questionnaires and to cheat mm -hmm. their, blood, their medical tests. And if they do so, that can lead to a bad outcome for both the donor and the recipient. So I don't suggest anyone going to the black market. I know uh, $80,000 is enticing. Frankly, I have to know that people get less than that. That's maybe what they pay, but the actual donor doesn't get all that much. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was just joking about that. That's, that's <laughs> great, though. But, but it sounds like you did your research, well. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did. Well, I told people one of the benefits is like, um, now when I go to a third world country to travel, I, I wear a sign already taken. I don't know if you're <laughs> ending up in a bathtub, <laughs> you know? Oh my gosh, that's, that's horrible. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, so it's interesting. So basically, so if anybody in your immediate family needs, or if you need, you're immediately bumped to the top of the list. And that's not just, this is in Israel and that's not just kidneys. That's anything. Correct. 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 Uh, anything. Wow. And, and what, what is like, you, you, you touched on it earlier, but that is an interesting, it isn't donating organs like, a, you know, like a halakhic <laughs> issue. Most organs you can't donate unless you're dead. So, so I, was, I, I mean, I, I don't want to get into that because a because I'm not an expert, b because it's really a, a very, uh, in, you know, a very loaded topic. But lo donating organs. We like loaded topics. Donating organs post mortem when you're 100 percent dead is is not a halachic issue. Um, in fact, it's encouraged. The reason many people don't allow the signing on donor cards and different things like that is, first of all. There's a concern that if the doctor knows, they may have less of an incentive to keep you alive, right? Because your organs can save people. Uh, there's other ethical concerns, but on, on a basic level, it is uh, very much condoned. You are, if you are 100% dead by all halakhic you know, um, parameters, donating anything is great. In, in reality, what happens is people... Is that a difference of donating to other Jews or to non-Jews or anything like so, that? So, yeah, so they're, they're definitely, that, that argument is definitely made. That's also a, a good point. There are people who say you can only give to Jews. There are people who say otherwise. Um, once again, a very, very loaded topic um, because there's always, there's always a concept of, first of all, you don't know who it's going to. Second of all, you may only be a match to a non-Jew. Third of all, bumping people up on the list who are Jewish. And there's a lot of different factors there. Right. But um, what, what happens is in reality is that very, there's very rarely the opportunity to donate organs post-mortem if you take the traditional or mainstream halachic approach because once people are brain death, uh, the majority of their other organs die before their heart stops. So they end up having nothing to really donate. There are also organs that you may or may not be able to donate even post-mortem according to some halachic authorities. I'm no expert, but you know, life-saving organs you definitely can. But for instance, things like corneas or different things that people donate also that, that may help a person's life but not save their life mm. can become a question. So uh, I would say anyone who has those concerns, I, I personally am signed on a post-mortem card. Um, my, in Israel, you have the option on the Kartis Adi, you have the option to select three options. One is 
yes, one is no, and the third one is only if a rabbinic authority of my choosing allows the donating of the organs. So um, I put my Rebbe down there, and he'll have to make the tough decision if uh, it ever comes to that. Wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That, that that's is a very I, cool, that's a very yeah. interesting piece of information that I never heard. Yeah, and for that reason, I, I do suggest people signing the Kartis Adi, because even if you don't want to make that decision yourself, I mean, first of all, if your family says no, they won't take it anyways. And second of all, if you have a, a Rebbe or, or a rabbinic authority that, that you trust to make that decision, they will make the right decision. So, uh, you know, doesn't, there's no, no harm done. <laughs> Wow. And in Israel, actually, um, one of the benefits of signing that card is that it moves you higher up on the, the donation list as well. So there's, there's a, a, a selfish benefit too. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. That's really so, uh, incredible. I was uh, encouraged to share my story by the fact that I, that I was encouraged. You know, First of all, the whole conversation only started because of this debate between my Rebbe and Robbie Berman. And then later, it was only rekindled because of my, my friend who donated to her father. Um, and because of that, I, I do try to share my story. And I, I shared it on Facebook. And it actually, three different people reached out to me to discuss it with me. So I, I don't know where any of them led. And it's okay if they didn't. Uh, just having the conversation is healthy. It means that if someone in your family is going to donate, coming in a little bit more prepared for it, it means it's right. more likely to happen. So I uh, thank you for, for having me here and uh, enabling me to share it with more, more people. Are you kidding? Yeah, it's, it's incredible. 